July of 2019, my wife and I welcomed our second child into the world, Maddox. A beautiful baby boy weighing in at 10 pounds, six ounces. It was so amazing to see our oldest son interact with his new little brother. And I was so proud of my wife. Everything was going well until it wasn't. The next thing I knew, I was driving down I-75 in a torrential downpour, racing a helicopter that was carrying my eight-day-old son to a children's hospital. The doctor at the ER had told us, he has a bacterial infection. We have 12 hours to find the cause or the damage would be irreversible. Over the next week, my wife and I split time between our house with our three-year-old and in the hospital with our newborn. Now, as a college softball coach, you tend to meet a lot of people. By Wednesday of that week, my phone was blowing up with text messages, emails, social media messages, all coming from current players, former players, coaches from around the state, colleagues at work, and of course, friends and family. I was overwhelmed. In 2015, I took over the Lake Sumter State College softball program, and I quickly learned I was gonna have to change the culture off the field to properly affect the outcome on the field. Sitting there in that hospital room, I realized we had accomplished exactly what we had set out to do. Change the culture, create better people, not just better ball players. In 2018, we broke the school record for wins in a season, had our best finish in Mid-Florida Conference history, and had our first winning season since the year 2000. In three short years, we took one of the most down on their luck programs in the state and made them competitive. How? Realizing it all begins with people and not necessarily athletes was the starting point. The second realization was creating a culture that welcomed everyone for who they are. One of the first players we signed was a young girl named Rachel. When Rachel arrived on campus in the fall of 2016, I wasn't quite sure what to make of her. She was a commuter, so she lived at home with her family and not in the apartments with the other players. Her teammates weren't sure what to make of her either. They knew that she was homeschooled and that her religion was the most important thing to her, very different than most girls her age. A few practices go by and I notice toward the end of each day that Rachel becomes reserved and tries to isolate herself from the rest of the team. During a team bonding exercise, she actually tells us that she gets homesick during practice and how all day she just misses her family and wants to be with them. But remember, Rachel lives at home. My thought process was, why fight this kid? Why try to change her? Instead, embrace her for everything that makes her unique and wonderful. Being homesick means you love hard, and players who love hard are the ones that are willing to go the extra mile for you. The next time I saw Rachel getting into her end of the practice funk, I just walked over and I said, Rach, I wanna go home too. I miss my wife and son. Give me 10 more minutes and we'll be on the road. Now, how would other coaches you know have reacted to this kid? How would you have reacted to this kid? She appreciated the fact that we accepted her for who she was and didn't try to change her. I considered who she was as a person before selfishly considering what I needed her to be as a ball player. Rachel responded to that environment of love and support by being a two-time all-conference selection. She was a two-time NJCAA all-academic first team member. She was the first player from our program to be selected as the State of Florida Gene Williams Award winner. She finished her academic career with a perfect 4.0 GPA, and in 2018, Rachel was the only first baseman in the entire country at any level of collegiate softball to lead her conference in stolen bases. It all comes down to environment. And the question I pose to you is, are you creating a place at work, within your community, on your team that allows people to feel good about themselves every day they come in? A study done by Gallup in 2017 tells us that 85% of people worldwide hate their job. 
Now that number goes down slightly in the US to a mere 70% of people who strongly dislike their job or their boss. Those numbers are extremely discouraging as we see the depression rates and suicide rates continuing to climb. It's time we start putting people first and thinking of them as employees or team members second. In Savannah, Georgia, there's a summer baseball team made up of college players from all over the country. You may have heard of them. They're called the Savannah Bananas. They're known for crazy antics like wearing kilts while they play or playing in all bright yellow uniforms in front of sold out crowds every single night. Whenever you see the bananas, they're having fun doing what they love. Jesse Cole, the owner of the bananas says, it's all about the atmosphere. In a three year period, the bananas have won more games than any other team in the Coastal Plains League. Jesse explains it this way. He said, we don't focus on the wins and losses. We don't focus on the baseball, but what happens is because of the atmosphere, because they're having fun, they play better. An assistant professor at Georgia Southern University named Curtis Sproul heard this, decided he wanted to put it to the test. Does culture, does environment impact on field performance? What Professor Sproul did was he collected the data over that three year period. He then took all the NCAA Division I players and compared their stats to that of when they played for the Bananas. He then did the same thing for the entire league. Specifically, he looked at OPS, a player's on-base percentage plus slugging percentage, one of the most telling stats when evaluating offensive performance. In Professor Sprawl's words, after running the data for the entire league, the only team that showed a significant positive relationship for improving players' performance was the Savannah Bananas. To this point, Professor Sproul's research shows a direct correlation between environment, culture, and on-field performance. There's a saying in the sports world, feel good, play good, so simple but yet so underutilized by all those in different kinds of leadership positions. Looking back at that same Gallup poll that told us the alarming number of people who hate their job worldwide, it gave us another piece of information. Of the 1 million US workers polled, 75% have quit a job because of their boss or immediate supervisor. It wasn't their position or their colleagues in the workplace but management and how they conducted business. And it all comes back to culture and environment, which is created by leadership. Now, inspired by the events that took place while my son was in the hospital and to much of my family's surprise, I wrote a book. It's called The Island, an unconventional way of coaching people, not players. I wrote about our program and our culture and how it's changed and why it's important. Most people already have this image in their mind when they think of coaches. They think intensity, veracity, anger, and of course, yelling. There's actually a chapter in the book titled, Yelling is Barbaric. And it was an important chapter to write because it gives opposing views on yelling and why we refrain from doing so with our athletes. Now, I grew up around yelling from a coach who was also my father. And in my father's defense, he yelled just as many good things as he did bad things. Do I yell sometimes? Yes, but I absolutely hate it. And it is a last ditch effort to get someone's attention. I'm able to get to that level with my players because of the relationship I build with each individual person. They know me and they know the values I'm trying to instill in them, and they know that I only come from a place of love. If you do not have that relationship with your players, yelling can spread like a cancer and tear a team apart. The problem with consistent yelling is it desensitizes the athletes. They come to know it as normal, and it creates an environment filled with negativity. Remember, feel good, play good. During our first fall game at Lake Sumter, our shortstop had a ball hit to her, and it went right between her legs. 
she stopped what she was doing after she committed the error, looked straight at me in the dugout. Once the inning was over, I walked over to her and I said, why'd you stop going after that ball? She said, I made an error. Aren't you gonna yell at me? She had been conditioned by previous coaches that making an error meant you were gonna get berated. Now, how does that fix anything? When one athlete's getting yelled at, the other ones hear it and they tighten up, not wanting to make the same mistake. And we all know what happens when we think about not making mistakes. We tend to make those mistakes. Now, for the first four years at Lake Sumter, my father was my assistant coach and we got along very well, most of the time. When things didn't go as planned, he would revert back to his old school ways. I once threw my own father out of the dugout in the middle of a game because he was being too negative. The negativity was spreading to the players and they became afraid to move or even talk and you can't be successful in that atmosphere. Now my father is as old school as it gets, but he constantly worked at being better about what he said and how he said it. After four years, my father left the program for a higher pay and less responsibility, and I never understood why. But he went back to the high school level and was coaching football as well as softball. One day I asked him how football was going and his answer stopped me in my tracks. He said, I don't get it. All these coaches do is yell at these kids and expect different results when the kids don't even hear them anymore. I was so proud of my father for seeing things from a different perspective after all these years. There was a study done at Brigham Young University by David C. Barney and Alema Toilili that looked at the correlation between coaches who consistently yelled at their athletes and the athletes' responses. The study asked 124 former athletes 11 questions. The second question asked was, what was your immediate response after being yelled at? Answers ranged from angry, mad, to disappointed, and even fearful. Previous research has shown athletes are more negatively affected by being yelled at than actually motivated. And the implications of the study stated that coaches who consistently yell at their athletes are not going to yield the results that they want. It's time we stop looking at people as employees, pencil pushers, and dollar makers, and simply look at them as people. Remember the golden rule, treat others as you would wanna be treated. As for my son Maddox, he's thriving at 19 months old, and he's just like his mother. So beautiful, but will stare daggers through your very soul when he gets hangry. And I'd like to end with this. Coach your players hard, but love them as people even harder. Thank you. <laughs>